they don't have the police, the wide ranging police functions that this, uh, these three organizations have. Now, the State Security Department, often, as I said, referred to as Ministry of State Security, carries out a wide range of counterintelligence and internal security functions, normally associated with what we would call a secret police. It's charged with uh, searching out anti-state criminals, those accused of anti-government and dissident activities, economic crimes, and disloyalty to the political leadership. Uh, political prisons, the Gulag in North Korea, is run out of the State Department's 7th Bureau. So it is, that is, these are the guys that really kind of in, ensure uh, political thought in, in North Korea, and they are the ones that, that handle the cases that end up uh, sending people to the Gulags. Um, it has uh, counterintelligence responsibilities at home and abroad and runs overseas intelligence collection operations, mainly within China working to try to bring back uh, defectors that have gone abroad back to, uh, to the regime, uh, as well as, as collecting a wide variety of information uh, that is very critical to the stability of the regime. Uh, it monitors political attitudes and maintains the surveillance of those who have returned from other countries and gone back to Korea, like recently has happened over the last couple of weeks where you had a South Korean defector who went back to North Korea. Uh, this person would be right now being handled by the uh, by the SSD. For years, since the 1980s, it was assumed that the SSD had uh, uh, answered directly to Kim Jong Il because there wasn't a director that was publicly known since the death of the la uh, the last known director in the in the late 1980s. But with Kim's death, we learned that uh, this uh, this ministry is now headed by Kim Won Hong. And Kim Won Hong is a very interesting figure who has really emerged since 2009 uh, and is very closely tied to Kim Jong Un. He has a background with the General Political uh, Bureau, which oversees the loyalty within the within the armed forces, essentially the political commissars. And he also was, ironically enough, the head of the uh, Military Security Command before he became the head of the uh, of the uh, the SSD, which uh, I think was fairly interesting. This guy is really steeped in how this apparatus works. And at the um, leadership events in uh, in April at the Fourth Party Conference in the uh, in the Supreme People's Assembly, he was elevated to the Politburo, the Central Military Commission, and the National Defense Commission. He's one of the few people. Uh, along with some of the other people involved in this apparatus that does sit on all of those bodies, showing that he is a really not only uh, vital to the internal security apparatus, but he is a major political player as well. As for the Ministry of People's Security, this is uh, responsible for internal security, social control, and basic police functions. This is the regular police, um, the ministry that carries out regular police functions within the, within the regime. It's estimated to have uh, <laughs> around 210,000 security personnel, maintains law and order, investigates common criminal cases, operates the regular political uh, prison system, the regular prison system, not the political prison system, monitors citizens' political attitudes, conducts background investigations, conducts the census that when North Korea does can carry out census, oversees civil registrations and registrations of every individual in North Korea and their background, controls individual tra uh, travel, controls the traffic. So those women that you see sa uh, standing out in, in Pyongyang Square that are directing the non-existent traffic, they belong to the, the Ministry of People's Security. Uh, it manages government's classified documents, uh, protects government and party officials, patrols government buildings, and some government and party construction activities. Now its fortunes have really kind of risen and fallen and risen again since the 1990s. Um, it was considered, it's considered the weakest of these uh, politically in terms of these three, um, three police agencies. Uh, in the 1990s it suffered because of its inability to ensure the order and discipline during the famine years. Its fortunes began to rise uh, in the months after Kim Jong-il's stroke in 2008. It was a leading player in the lead up to the currency revaluation in 2009, after which it <laughs> suffered another setback and led to the replacement of its, uh, of its minister, Chu Song Song, and it, who was replaced by Li Mang Su, a military officer with ties to the general staff in the National Defense Commission. And under Li Mang Su's uh, 
tutelage, uh, the Ministry of People's Security profile has once been, again begun to rise, and he has become also a member of the Politburo, the Central Military Commission, and the National Defense Commission. And then the final is the Military Security Command, which is the investigative unit of the armed forces. Not only does it provide an additional layer of surveillance to the uh, monitoring the, the, uh, the actions of the military beyond what is done by the General Political Bureau, it also contributes to the personal protection of the Supreme Leader. Its primary responsibilities are monitoring the loyalty of the High Command and ferreting out possible coup plots in the armed forces. So to, over the last few days when, uh, when uh, uh, Young uh, Ho was dismissed, I'm, I'm sure that the Military Security Command was on high alert and was paying very close attention to, uh, to the attitudes of, of essentially general level flag level officers in the in the North Korea. Um, in the 1990s its, uh, its uh, portfolio began to grow uh, and it took over some limited non-military investigative missions down at the provincial level. And the Military Security Command in many respects is the most shadowy of the internal security agencies. We just don't know a whole lot about this organization. Its li lineage is shrouded in mystery uh, we believe that it started uh, in the 1950s as it emerged out of them, the Ministry of People's uh, Armed Forces, and its fortunes are intimately tied to the Kim family. It was the Military Security Command that helped ferret out the Sixth Corps incident in the mid-1990s, an incident that brought to surface its ongoing turf battle that it has with the, uh, the State Security Department. And it's ironic then that uh, its previous head, Kim Won Hong, is now the head of the SSD. And Kim was replaced by Cho Kyung Chol, a former General Political Bureau officer in the, uh, in the uh, Air Force. <coughs> Not much is known about Cho, as he is a recent figure in North Korean politics. And unlike his opposite numbers in the State Security Department and the Ministry of People's Security, he does not occupy any positions in the leading party bodies. Now, those are the, the, basically the three uh, major police organizations. In oversight of these agencies, especially the SSD and the Ministry of People's Security, flow up through the party apparatus to the uh, party's administrative department, which is headed by Chang Song Taek, and um, which is Kim Jong, as you all know, Kim Jong Un's uncle. The chain of command for the um, Military Security Command runs up through the military, uh, the Ministry of People's Armed Forces, and from there up to the National Defense Commission. And of course, the SSD and the Ministry of People's Security run through the Kim Chung Son take up to the National Defense Commission because of the fact that he's a vice chairman on the NDC. Uh, the uh, Organization Guidance Department, which of course is the mo one of the most powerful organizations in uh, the party apparatus, also plays a role in oversight of these bodies and that it has uh, ties into the organizational and political departments in each one of these agencies. But despite all of this oversight, one thing the history of the North Korean uh, police state shows is the almost constant competition and turf battles that exist between these various legs of the triangle. In the 1990s, the SSD and the uh, Military Security Command allegedly squared off in a number of high profile battles the Military Security Command taking full advantage of the SSD's attempts to sweep uh, corruption under the rug. So at that time you had the, the Military Security Command was elevated in its profile and the SSD was essentially put in a doghouse, uh, a place where it's ex really kind of remained up until the last few years where it's really kind of uh, hit up its profile. All right, I see I only have a few more minutes to go, so I will speed through this. The other part of the, uh, the apparatus that uh, the, the report looks at is the, the structure of the Imyambang, which is the neighborhood or people's group that con uh, constitutes the uh, basic cell of North Korean uh, uh, social structure. It is through this apparatus that the security apparatus is able to monitor people even in their households on a daily unit on a daily basis and, the, and these various uh, household units then report up to the, uh, to the internal security apparatus. Um, the second part of the book uh, deals with how the, the process uh, or the, the apparatus operates. It deals with, uh, discusses the internal uh, security apparatus's uh, informant networks. There are 
hundreds of thousands, if not millions of informants that exist in North Korea that report on a variety of different things, both up to the State Security Department as well as to the Ministry of People's Security, that really kind of keep the, uh, the population, uh, the monitoring and surveilling of the population is uh, quite extraordinary and beyond anything that I've ever seen looking at any other uh, totalitarian apparatus. Um, I talk a little bit about uh, investigation and detention and how how these various agencies look at uh, uh, conduct uh, investigations into uh, into uh, various quote unquote crimes uh, by the North Korean population and how those are then uh, processed through the trials so some of which actually take place and some of which don't and many of them take place uh, behind closed doors and then I talk finally about the, the punishment aspect in North Korea a little bit about the prison system as well as executions and how they are carried out in North Korea, some of them being high profile, while other ones taking place behind closed doors. So in conclusion, in 2012, the North Korean regime finds itself faced with many problems that threaten internal security and internal stability. Not only is the country facing another year of food shortages, but Kim Jong-il's death raises many questions about the regime's stability at the top. The information cordon that once surrounded the country has deteriorated and information about the outside world filters in through cell phones, DVDs, and surreptitious radio and television monitoring. North Korean leaders talk ceaselessly about efforts to pave the way for a great and prosperous state, which such, but such a strategy seems doomed to failure by any stretch of logic. And looking forward to the future, many North Korean watchers have already begun to speculate about the eventual collapse of the hermit kingdom. How can it continue to defy gravity? Just as the Soviet Union collapsed and Mao's China evolved, certainly the Kim's family dynasty cannot continue as it has living in the dark ages, refusing to join the community and nations. Or can it? Whether or not North Korea collapses, evolves, or continues to muddle through will depend a great deal on the viability of the internal security apparatus. And for 60 years, this all-pervasive apparatus has ensured the survival of the Kim family dictatorship in recent years, however, rumors have begun to seep out that the, through the defector community that cracks may have begun in the repressive system with the security personnel being more susceptible to bribes, discipline among provincial level police waning, members of the MM bond turning a blind eye, and even the public taking retribution against members of the police force. Is this an indication of the beginning of the end? Unfortunately, with the opaqueness which surrounds the North Korean state, it is impossible to tell. At best, scholars and intelligence analysts can only watch and continue to piece together the puzzle. But one thing is clear, as long as the regime continues to adhere to the tactics of the police state, to hold on to power, human rights in North Korea will continue to be violated, and the unfortunate citizens of the country will continue to live in the shadows. Thank you.